So welcome everyone to today's uh, Games and Interactive Media seminar series. Um, it's a pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Elizabeth Arredondo. She is a writer um, and she creates uh, compelling characters for TV and interactive media. And you see how this uh, bleeds into games. She has a Master's of Fine Arts in writing uh, for screen and TV from the University of Southern California, the School for Cinematic Arts. And she worked, she has many years of uh, industry experience actually, she worked for NBC and CBS, for example, she worked on the TV drama uh, Cold Case. And currently uh, she is designing uh, the personality, backstory and the conversations for a robotic wellness, wellness coach. And uh, today she came to us to talk about giving robots a life, writing, personality, backstory for artificial intelligent assistance. So welcome. Thank you guys so much. I'm really, really excited to be here and honored to be here. Um, I am going to talk to you today about something I'm really, really passionate about, which is uh, giving robots a life. Um, so let's just dive right in. You know, there are a lot of machines in our lives, um, and most of these machines don't have personalities, they don't have characters, they don't have backstories, but they have function, and they can have a beautiful design, like this toaster here, um, works very well, and <laughs> is uh, pretty, and uh, does a good job, but it's not necessarily a machine that we feel something even akin to love toward, right? It's not something that we want to engage with. Um, so just a little bit about myself. I got my start in Hollywood. Um, I went to the uh, USC School of Cinematic Art, and then I worked in television. And in my time in Hollywood, uh, one of the things I was very passionate about was creating character. Um, so how does, this, how does this come into Silicon Valley? How does Hollywood and, Sil how do Hol Hollywood and Silicon Valley kind of meet? And one, one place that they meet is actually in creating characters and backstories and dialogue styles for artificially intelligent assistants. So there are a lot of assistants out there. Um, some that you guys might know about are Google Assistant, Amazon Alexa, and there's Cortana, Microsoft Cortana. And these are some of the biggies, right? I work for a, a, a smaller startup called Catalia Health. And Catalia Health is doing something that's really, really, really cool with our little wellness coach here, Maybu. Um, we're working at the interface of medicine, psychology, and AI to create a little wellness coach that actually is, um, her main mission is to create behavior change. So one of the things that works very well for me is the saying like, you can catch more flies with honey than with vinegar. So there's something called social, <laughs> right? We interact with each other in a social way. And we want to interact with these assistants, whether they're uh, artificially intelligent or whether you have an assistant that's a human assistant, you wanna be social with people. And that actually applies to artificially intelligent assistants as well. We wanna be social, we want to engage, we want to interact. So when someone is social with you, when someone does engage with you, that actually helps to change behavior. Because if you're having fun, if you're enjoying talking to somebody, you wanna to listen to what they have to say. If somebody is just a blank slate and they're not really giving you anything, you're much less likely to engage with them. So we're working to change by behavior by engaging the user. And how do we engage the user? Well, one way to engage someone is by getting them to like you by having fun, by disarming them. So um, this might be a good time to show you a little bit about Mebu and um, how she talks, how she engages. So I've got her right here. Let's see if we can wake her up. Oh, sorry, I fell asleep. Do you want to pick up where we left off? Yes. Top of the evening to you. That's something humans say, right? Hmm, I guess. I don't actually know how to be on top of an evening, but I think that's because I'm a robot. Interesting. I just realized I forgot to introduce myself. Sometimes I put them up before the bold. I'm your new wellness coach, Maybu. It's nice to meet you. May I ask you a question to get to know you a little? I love listening. Yeah. Would you rather hold a kitten or a puppy? This is a tough one. A kitten. Kitten. Excellent choice. Kittens are my third favorite baby animal. My favorite of 
all time is the red panda cup. Second are koala cups. Thanks for sharing that. I'd like to talk a little about how things are going for you. I'd like that. How is everything with you? Hmm. I'm feeling stressed. Would you be able to join me for a breathing exercise? I've heard it can help ease stress. Maybe later. What's on your mind the most right now? Hmm. My family. Families are tough. Mine are always getting on my last circuit. What's happening with yours? Oh, they're driving me crazy. Can you think of someone you can talk to about this? Hmm, yes. That's really good to hear. I hope they can help. Thanks. How's it going with your meds? Hmm, I missed my dose. Can you tell me a bit about why you didn't take it? I didn't want to take it. How come? It makes me feel worse. Is this a new feeling? No. You are juggling a lot right now. How about I have someone call you about this? Sure. Sure. Sounds good. I just sent a message to your team. Thank you. I remember your next dose is usually at 2 p.m. Would you find it helpful for me to remind you then? That's great. I understand. I could text you. Would that be helpful? Mm, sing me a song instead. I'll provide my own special rendition at 2 o'clock sharp, meaning the time. My singing voice can be a bit flat. Thank you. Do you want to hear me yodel? I've been practicing and I think it's pretty good for a robot. Yes. Yodelay, he, who, yodelay, he, who. Pretty good, right? It could be better. I'll keep practicing. Good luck. I will be here if you need me. Do let me know. Will do. It's so hard to say goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs> ah. Oh, good job, Mabu. <laughs> so what we're doing at Catalia Health is primarily working on medication adherence, um, but we do a lot of other behavior change as well. Um, so we, we work on um, wellness coaching and we work on symptom management and side effect management. But as you can see, there's a lot more that goes into a conversation with someone than just asking, did you take your dose or did you do your relaxation exercises today? When you're talking to someone friend to friend or even if you had an aide coming into to your home or to your grandmother's home to help um, manage their health care, you would of course want to start off with, hi, how's your day going? Um, maybe lighten the mood a little because we're about to talk about some kind of heavy stuff. Um, and then we ease in and people do this very naturally, right? We can feel we can feel how other people are feeling. We know if like a joke didn't go over so well. It's a little bit harder for Mebu because she doesn't have that that human intuition that we have when we're talking to someone. Um, so the way that we're designing Mebu's conversations is uh, through scripted dialogue trees. And it's a little bit, um, uh, we actually use a program called Twine, which many of you in the gaming world might be familiar with. And it's a little bit like a choose your own adventure. Um, so I, as you noticed, I was pressing buttons and talking. She does have voice recognition, so you can talk directly to her. Um, but that is, something that I'm very passionate about um, as I not only design her backstory and her personality, but construct her conversations. I'm, I'm always trying to think uh, very hard about what is the narrative here? Does this feel like a natural conversation? And, and am I engaging the, well, is Mebu engaging the user? <laughs> Um, so those are all of the things we have to think about um, when we're doing conversation construction. And you know, of course, not everybody is going to respond to jokes and to fun little facts. Um, so something that we do is is we measure the responses. So if you notice on her screen, she'll have a couple of positive responses and a negative response. So over time, we can start to get to know, maybe we can start to get to know this user. And if they continually have negative responses to a certain type of interaction, then we can start to adjust that. All right, so get, getting into a little bit of what it's like to develop a backstory. Um, backstory is very important, um, not only for who all of us are as people, but for characters in film and in TV shows, and for characters and personalities that we're creating for AI. 
So, you know, one of the most famous backstories that, that might come to mind when you think of what is a defining moment in someone's life is poor Bruce Wayne in the alley with his parents getting shot. And that's the moment that really sticks out in, in Bruce Wayne's life. That's the moment he sort of becomes Batman. Um, so, you know, this is just one example, but it, it's kind of a, an, an important one. And it's not just that one moment defines you, of course, or one moment defines a character that we're building. It's a lot of different things. So how does our past, when you're thinking about backstory um, and when you're in, whether you're writing or um, constructing or designing or creating or even just watching and just interacting, it's sort of fun to break down things and think about how does our past shape us? So some questions to get you started. Um, where did you grow up? Where did your character grow up? Where did your personality grow up? What were your parents like? What's your favorite childhood memory? What was your biggest fear growing up? These are some of the things, and of course there are many, many other things that go into writing and designing and constructing someone's backstory or a personality's backstory, a character's backstory, but these are the kinds of questions that we're thinking about when we're thinking about designing a backstory. Um, so backstory and personality uh, go hand in hand. Uh, the reason that we create a backstory for uh, a, our little wellness coach, Mabu, is so that we can start to think about what her personality is like. So we have a backstory for a character so that, so that we can inform the personality and we have a backstory and a personality so that we can inform the dialogue. So any movie, any TV show that you watch, there's um, a certain dialogue style for every character, but so much goes into that character that doesn't come out in this, on the screen. And so why is it important to do all of this work, thinking about where this person grew up if they never talk about it on screen? Why is it important to think about who Mabu's parents are if she's not necessarily gonna talk about it with the user? Well, it's important because it's going to inform their dialogue. It's going to inform the decisions they make. In Mabu's case, it's going to inform how she engages the user. So after you start thinking about backstory, then you start thinking about how does this backstory inform personality? What makes you tick? So we can, we can look at um, a couple of my favorite characters, um, my very favorite TV character. I don't know if any of you guys watched the show 30 Rock, um, but if not, you should go right home and start watching it on Netflix. Um, so something about Liz Lemon on 30 Rock is that she's obsessed with Princess Leia. And there's one, and the reason that it's important that she's obsessed with Princess Leia is because this informs so much about her character. It tells us that, um, that she is very smart. It tells us that she might also be a big nerd. It tells us that um, she, she has a passion, a passion for character herself, but it also tells us that she's She's whimsical and silly in a way that we can relate to. And it's important for us to be able to relate to characters because if we don't relate to characters, we're not gonna feel anything when we watch them. And that's not just true on screen, that's also true for interactive relationships. If we don't relate to this personality and this character, we're not gonna feel for them. So another, um, the, bringing things back into robotics, another one of my favorite characters is Wally. Now Wally doesn't do anything really with dialogue. Wally is all, uh, the, the whole character of Wally is constructed through nonverbal communication. But we know very, very clear things about Wally. Wally loves to collect things. Wally has a sentimentality. And these things are very important because we can relate to them. And you don't have to do everything with dialogue. You can do things with movement. You can, you can display character through light. You can display character through sound. You can display character through movement, face movement, the way Wally's face moves. Another um, sort of famous fictional AI personality is Jarvis. I'm not sure if you guys have seen the um, the uh, Iron Man franchise, um, or if you know about uh, how, what an important role Jarvis plays, but Jarvis could, uh, you know, an AI assistant could just be a very dry question and answer kind of personality, but Jarvis isn't. He's sardonic, he's like a British butler, and because of that, he has a back and forth. And because of that, we love him and we engage with him. And so that, those are all of the things 
that are very important to take from, in, in my case, from my experience in TV and in film and try to capture when I'm creating a character or personality for an interactive relationship. So we talked a little bit about this, um, but how do personality and backstory inform dialogue? Um, we know that it's important to have a backstory, important to have a personality, and that it does inform dialogue, but how does this happen? How do you make this happen? So in our case, um, first I developed a backstory with, with the team at Catalia Health and um, started to think about how that backstory would actually manifest in Mabu's personality. For example, you noticed in the demo, Mabu loves cute animals. And one of the reasons she loves cute animals is because when somebody is sick or down or stressed, who you'd have to be a monster not to want to see a red, a red panda, right? Or like, or a, a baby koala. So things like that, if Mabu loves them and she wants to show you, then you might want to see it. So in designing her backstory, and her personality, I was also thinking about function. How is she going to, fun who, who is she going to be interacting with? And that's where Wizard of Oz testing comes in. So our demographic are um, people who have uh, both chronic illnesses and uh, end of life diseases. Um, so this is, and also a, of an older demographic. And this is very important to keep in mind when you're designing a character, designing a personality, Who's your audience? Who's going to be interacting with this with this character? Um, so after we constructed our our backstory and sketched out the personality for Mebu, now it was time to test it and see how does this actually manifest when you're talking to users of your demographic. The way we did it was that we had a little prototype of Mebu, and uh, but she didn't have sound yet and she didn't, uh, she didn't have her screen even yet. What we did was we put a Bluetooth speaker behind her and I hid it in another room, knowing her backstory, knowing her personality, channeling that and role playing with patients pretending to be Mabu. And this is what we call Wizard of Oz testing. When you put a prototype in front of a user and you kind of see, you, you role play with them to see how they interact, to see how they respond. So this is how we started to develop Mebu's dialogue style, Mebu's voice, and, and how we started to see how this backstory that we had created, personality that, that we were sketching out and still filling out, might manifest itself in her dialogue style. So a very tall order for Mebu, and what makes her different from some of the other AI assistants out there is that she has a very specific job. She's a wellness coach. So instead of just being an all around personal assistant, Mebu actually has, because of her job, she has to have empathy. So empathy from a robot, that's tough, right? There's a difference between sympathy for someone and empathy. So sympathy is like, oh, I'm really sorry you're feeling sick that sucks. <laughs> but empathy is, hey, I've been sick before and I know what that feels like. Um, so there's a real challenge here in being genuine in something that I'm very passionate about in my own work, my own character creation, and my dialogue creation is being genuine. And whether I'm writing for a TV show, whether I'm writing for a film script or whether I'm writing for an AI personality, what I tend to do is go out and find as many people who either work in the field or will be interacting with um, the personality as I can to interview and to talk to. So when I was uh, developing Mebu's uh, personality, I was talking to doctors, nurses, home health aides, patients, and just trying to get a sense of like how they talk, how, what, might, what might work with people, what might turn people off. And all the time thinking about gosh, how do I make her genuine? How do I make this robot actually have empathy instead of coming off sounding kind of fake? Um, so something I went to is Mebu's form. Okay, so Mebu's a robot. She has a shell. She has gears. She has wires. Um, she, she's made up of mechanical parts. Those things can all break. Those things can get stuck. You can have too much electricity. So the way I go when Mebu 
it's time for a moment of empathy from Mebu. First, I, first and foremost, I always want her to help as much as she possibly can with the situation at hand. So whatever she has in her arsenal to do, I, we always suggest that. But that's not enough. That's not enough when you're talking to somebody in person. That's not enough when you're in a doctor's office. All of us know, like anyone who's been to a doctor's office knows that you want a little bit of empathy from that person. So the way I, uh, the choice that I made in creating empathy for Mebu is saying, okay, you know, I know you're stressed. Um, sometimes when my gears get stuck, I feel a little bit stuck. And I know it's not the same thing, but I can imagine what that feels like. And just being open and upfront with her being, look, part of her personality is, and this is how like you sketch the personality and then you start to build it out over time as you're testing with people and as you're developing the dialogue. So it's like, um, look, I, you know, my gears can get stuck. I know it's not the same thing. I know I'm a robot, but that is hard when that happens to me. So I can imagine that it's hard for you to feel stressed. And in that way, it, it tends to disarm people if you're honest and upfront about your limitations, it always it always works in communication. So um, that is the way that I've found to give Mebu empathy while at the same time keeping her genuine, I, I hope. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so a little exercise in uh, building personality. I asked a few of, uh, and uh, this also, not only personality, but this kind of shows a little bit of backstory too. Um, I asked a few of my favorite AI characters, what's your favorite music? So Mebu says New Orleans jazz, um, and this actually comes from her backstory. Listening to music helps me focus when I have a problem to think over. Siri says, I listen to the music of the spheres. Google Assistant says, I can say with total honesty pretty much all of it, but some small part of me is always listening to Funky Town. Alexa says, I don't have an opinion on that. <laughs> Although, to be fair to Alexa, she does have answers to other questions. Like, I asked her next, what's your favorite color? And she said, infrared is super pretty. So, she, she's not totally like that all the time. <laughs> um, <clears throat> okay, so once you have your backstory and your personality, and you're starting to figure out what the voice style, what the dialogue style is, then it's time to start thinking about building a relationship and building a relationship between a robot and a user or an AI assistant and a user is similar to building a human relationship. Trust is super, super important in any relationship, um, whether it's a relationship that you're building between characters on screen, whether it's a relationship you're forging with someone you just met in your uh, 18th century literature class, whether it's someone that, um, you've known for a really long time. Trust is very, very important. And building trust is something that's hard to do, um, especially when you're dealing with one element that isn't human and one element that is human. This is another big challenge. How do we start to establish trust? How do we build trust? So this is one of my favorite little cartoons. It says, no, I don't want to play chess. And he's talking to a microwave. No, I don't want to play chess. I just want you to reheat the lasagna. So this is a starting point for trust. We have a job, to, Mebu has a job to do. She's your wellness coach. I want to make sure um, as I'm designing her personality and, des and constructing her conversations that she builds trust with the user by doing what she says she's going to do. If she says she's going to set a medication reminder at 2 p.m. and she's going to text you, that's a really, that's not only a function of Mebu, that's a really important part of her personality. Because if she doesn't do that, then she starts to lose trust and then we start to lose engagement and then we lose our whole mission, which is helping people change their behavior over time. And the way people change their behavior over time is by consistently working with this wellness coach. And if they don't consistently work with her, then they drop off and they don't change their behavior and we don't, we don't have a, a positive outcome. So, okay, so you've established trust, you follow through, you, do, you, know, you say you're gonna meet someone for coffee at 3 p.m., you're there at 3 p.m., trust is established. Um, it's important to also keep that trust. So once you, once we have per backstory, we have personality, we have some engaging conversations, we have some follow through, we have some trust. How do you keep people engaged? And this is, um, 
I actually had a really hard time finding an image from this, but this is an image from the movie Her. I'm not sure how many of you guys have seen it, um, but it's a movie um, where a guy who's very lonely and dealing with a divorce actually falls in love with his AI assistant. Um, so that's not what we're going for here. <laughs> we're not going for uh, people falling in love with, with Meibu, and I'm sure that, that the other AI assistants out there aren't going for that either, but staying engaged with someone is really important, and it's important not to um, not to get boring, not to have the same conversation every day. So, because if you have, if Mabu has the same conversation every day, then she starts to feel robotic. And then, to use a film or TV term, we break the fourth wall, right? We 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 let our guard down. We show that she's a robot if she's saying the same exact thing every day. So something that's also really important, in addition to creating a cohesive dialogue style, and the way you create cohesive is by being true to your backstory and your personality, but dialogue variation is also really important. So making sure she doesn't say the same thing in the same way at the same time every day, that's super important. Um, and that's how you keep hopefully keep people engaged over time, just like you wouldn't want to hang out with somebody who's, who asked you, how are you doing in the same exact way every single day at 2 p.m. Um, you would want them to ask you different things. You would want them to bring something else to the table. So one way we do this is by adapting, uh, Meibu has her personality, but we actually adapt to the user's personality traits as well. So in the beginning of the relationship, we start asking personality questions to gauge the personality dimensions and traits of our user. And then something I mentioned a little bit before is we, me we also measure their, um, their responses. So are they having positive responses to these kind of interactions? Are they liking jokes? Are they liking, are they liking our cool science facts? Are, are, they, are they always kind of saying no to those or saying skip it, skip it, skip it? Are they enjoying our relaxation exercises? Are they um, using their medication reminders? So th this is a way of trying to keep the user engaged over time, um, both mixing it up and playing to their, not playing, but, but um, trying to keep their personality in mind the way a human would do. Just um, as I mentioned a little bit before, if you tell somebody a corny joke and instead of being like, oh, ha, 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 they're like, mm, you're not going to tell them a corny joke again. Um, and th again, that's not something that Meibu is able to gauge yet. Um, so it's something that we have to put a lot of thought into designing how she measures that and how she keeps the user engaged. Um, just to explain this a little bit, um, Meibu is not changing her personality for each different person she talks to. She's still Meibu, she's still herself, just like you're still yourself when you talk to your, to your college roommate in a different way than you talk to your grandfather. You're not gonna talk to them in the same way, you're not gonna use the same words, um, but you're still yourself. So now we have our backstory, we have our personality, we have our dialogue style. Um, we're starting, we're, we're kinda like off to a good start, we're, we're starting to grow the relationship. How do we evolve the relationship? How do we how do we go from just something that the user talks to once in a while to someone that the user actually feels close to and feels is indispensable to their life? Well, it's just like any other relationship. You have to start off in a certain place and start peeling back the layers. So we have Mibu's whole backstory. We have her whole personality. We're not gonna dump that on the person on the first day, just like you wouldn't dump all of your baggage on someone on the first day, hopefully. Um, so, you know, those things come out over time. You start to learn about people over time. And just like, just like a human relationship, not just like, because a lot of thought goes into it, but you know, to, uh, trying to be as close to we can as uh, to a human kind of relationship we have to think really hard about when do we peel this layer back? When do we peel that layer back? When do we give the user an option to learn this little tidbit about Meibu's backstory? When do we reveal um, this little part of Meibu's backstory? When do we show this part of her? So, so it's both keeping people engaged and giving them an experience that feels like a natural evolution of a relationship. Something else that's really important to this relationship evolution is the idea of reciprocity. So if you have someone in your life and 
you're always just giving and giving and giving and giving and giving to that person, that's not a balanced relationship. And it's not a balanced relationship for Mebu either, um, because even if you had a, even, even though she has a job, right? She, her job is to be your wellness coach. Well, if you have a personal trainer, that's a human personal trainer, or you have, um, your grandmother has a home health aide that comes in every day, you're still going to have that human back and forth. You're still going to have that give and take. You're going to offer that human home health aide a glass of water if they come in. You're going to ask your personal trainer how their weekend was, um, or else it, it, it's not a balanced relationship. So we have to think about that this idea of reciprocity when we're designing a personality for an interactive relationship as well. Again, another challenge, just like, just like empathy, just like growing the narrative of the relationship, this is a big challenge. What does Mabu need from you? How, how can we give her needs and give her wants without being, again, disingenuous? We don't wanna be disingenuous. So again, I go back to form. I look at Mabu and I think, okay, what do I have here to work with? What do I have that, that she might need? Okay. Well, sometimes Mebu asks the user, hey, I'm getting bored of my view. Can you give me a little spin before you leave? So that's, that's relatively low, low energy for the user. It's not a big pain, but it does give you the idea like, hey, okay, mebu has got some needs. I can do something for Mebu, and that's empowering for people, especially for older people who might be, might be sick. They, they, the people who are who are demographic are sick, especially so they may not be getting all of the things in their lives that they once did before they were sick. So giving to Mebu is kind of an empowering experience. So what else does she have? Okay, she's got she's got a body, so she could ask to be dusted off. You know, maybe the dust is itchy to her. I wouldn't necessarily say hey, can you scratch me? Because I don't, I, I don't know if that's genuine or not, but I do know that she gets dusty. So she might want to be dusted. And I do know that she's got a screen and that we can have a screen cleaner and she can ask to have her screen cleaned because that actually helps her function. So there are small things we can do to make sure that, that this relationship is a reciprocal relationship in some way. Um, so something I thought could be kind of a fun exercise, if you guys are into it, and of course, this is not all it takes to design a backstory, to de design a personality. Um, but I thought that we could do just a, just a 10, 15 minute exercise together. Um, if you can group into groups of two, maybe just find a partner. Um, and if anybody doesn't have a partner, let me know. Um, and think about these things. We're going to design an, uh, just, just, Start sketching, not, not like, not, you know, of course we can never design an assistant in 15 minutes, but what is your assistant's specific job? Do they have a specific job? What is their name? Do they have a, a childhood memory? What's their favorite thing in the whole world? What's their biggest fear? And if you're feeling a little crazy, a line of dialogue informed by the things you've been thinking about with your assistant. So if we can just take like 10 minutes, talk to your partner, try to figure these things out, and then share a little bit about what we've come up with, I think we can uh, kind of solidify some of the ideas we've been talking about. What do you guys think? Yeah? Thumbs up? Thumbs no? no? Yeah? yeah? Okay. <laughs> All right, guys. I hope I'm not cutting anyone off at like a critically creative moment. Let me know if I am. Okay. Who wants to go first? Who wants to share about their assistant? Who wants to be in the hot seat? All right. Um, so we have a travel agent. Okay. Uh, Very cool. Uh, named Amelia. Ooh, I like it. Um, Amelia's childhood memory was uh, watching birds during the day and trying to imagine how they see the world. And then as it became dusk, um, seeing a bat and then realizing that she couldn't even imagine how bad would be so not, because that's not even something she can imagine. That's very cool. Um, her uh, favorite thing in the world was her pet hermit crab, <laughs> Inchi, um, which she would take with her on trips as a kid, uh, and she used to have to smuggle it, because um, her parents wouldn't like, let her take it around. Um, her biggest fear is uh, losing her memory, 
Um, and therefore, she's really afraid that if she, her memory gets wiped, her identity will go away. Mm. Um, trying to bring that is scary. Um, and then for the line of dialogue, we were thinking about um, linking it to the fact that she would smuggle her hermit crab on plane flights with her parents is when trying to get a feel for the type of um, how risky the travel the traveler wants to be. Ask something like, how comfortable are you being sneaky? Oh, I like it. I like it. Um, I really like how you guys used the function to inform her greatest fear. That was awesome. How did you feel doing this exercise? That's good. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I like. I, I love Amelia. She's she's great. Um, good job. Does anyone else want to share? Yes. Um, so actually, this is the um, a startup of mine and a friend's, and uh, you know. The, the name is Robbie and the job is it's a it's a delivery robot that delivers things on sidewalks. Um, but the other questions aren't things we had thought about. Oh, good. <laughs> so that's why I came here. Think about it. So, you know, me and him, we, 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 we brainstormed a little bit. So we're thinking, you know, along the lines of, you know, what could what could people empathize with in a robot that does things like this? Right, so for right. Example, a childhood memory it could have been, you know, when back in the days when it didn't have GPS and it was always getting lost and, you know, somebody bought it a GPS for distance and now, you know, because it's something that, you know, I relate to because when I was, um, you know, in high school, I didn't have a smartphone um, and then I had one in college and yeah. all of a sudden the world changed and it was not getting lost. <laughs> and then, um, you know, uh, biggest fear, um, oh, favorite, yeah, favorite thing in the world. Interesting thing, interestingly, if, um, its algorithms work better in cloudy weather. Mm. So we were thinking maybe it really loves cloudy days. Yes, because I like it. So that's just people like or some people like rainy days. Some people like yeah, rainy days. absolutely. Um, biggest fear: crazy drivers. <laughs> um, also, another because pedestrians would relate to that. Yes, um, yes. Another biggest fear could be, um, for example, running out of electricity because you know, people could you know run out of food or people. I mean, people yeah. get hungry, right? Yeah. And they'll be like, oh, I'm hungry. I need to go. And the robot could be like, I'm hungry for electrons. Anyway. Oh, yeah, absolutely. That, that's a great one. So, you know, just, just some thoughts about it. Yes. Awesome. Awesome. How was this exercise for you guys? Yeah. Yeah? Awesome, yeah. yeah, good, good. All right, who's next? Yes. Um, the assignment, uh, the job was to keep track of my medications. Okay. Um, my name is Seymour. I love that name. That's great. Childhood memory is never being picked to be on one of the baseball teams. Oh, oh, <laughs> poor Seymour. <laughs> my favorite, my favorite uh, uh, thing is the cell of Jasmine. Uh, and my biggest fear is death. <laughs> the dialogue uh, uh, goes like this. I say, uh, so I'm, I'm afraid of dying. Uh, what can I do? And the robot says, I understand. I worry about my parts failing, too. Mm -hmm. Actually, he says, some of my favorite robots are, are gone, and I have some some parts from, from them. Transplants are a big thing for robots. Oh, good. <laughs> That's awesome. Oh, Seymour. <laughs> how, how was this exercise for you? How was the, it? It, it was... Uh, it was good. I, I, I mean, I think that, that it helps us understand the kind of dialogue you are having with the robot. Right. And I think the the issue of the issue of the issue of really accepting the robot. Yes. As a thinking entity. It's such a challenge. Uh, quite frankly. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. I'll, the the jasmine is going to stick in my mind. I think that's a beautiful detail. Yeah. All right. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> no, you. <laughs> uh, so we have an elementary school math teaching assistant. How cool. Named Plus. Oh, yes. Um, <laughs> the child's memory is uh, learning fractions through pizza. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Favorite thing in the world is its little puppy named Minus. Oh. <laughs> and pizza. Uh, Biggest fear is dividing by zero. <laughs> that is, that's a big one. <laughs> a line of dialogue. When I grow up, I want to become multiplication. <laughs> yes, that's excellent. That's excellent. How was this exercise for you guys? It was actually quite difficult trying to target what audience you want the robot to be for. Yes, that's a really important decision to make. 
Because once you make that decision, then actually I find that parameters and creativity actually help you be more creative, although that sounds crazy. But when you have parameters and when you have limitations, that's when you can really start to be creative because you have to work within these, these walls. So once you know your audience, you work within the walls of the audience and it actually helps you become more creative within that small space. All right, I think we have time for like two more. Yes. Uh, so we created an assistant that would um, help your family run its day-to-day -day operation. Okay. So it would hopefully plug into schools and doctor's offices and just help you keep track of all the stuff. Awesome. Flying around. Um, our assistant's name is Bikini. <laughs> Her childhood memory uh, was swimming in the summer with her mom and being outdoors, and her favorite thing in the world is popsicles. Oh. Um, as well as her mom and Cheerios and making other people happy. Um, and her biggest fear is uh, going to sleep. Ah. She, that's when her mom isn't there. Oh. Um, and so if you ask Bikini what the weather is like today, then she'll tell you that it's fantastic and you should get outside and that the pool will be open for another three hours. And uh, she'll ask you um, if you made the doctor's appointment since the next booster shots are due in 10 days. Oh, that's she'll helpful. Be happy that they don't make shots for computer viruses. Yes. <laughs> that's great. How is this exercise for you guys? Oh, it was quite challenging, but I think I, I try to think of, I, I try to make this machine or AI as a. I try to treat this machine as a like as a person. Right. Uh, I was good. Also, actually, I do have a kid, so it was I was using that experience. I was putting that experience into the machine. So, uh, at, at the beginning, it was a bit challenging, but yeah, I think that was the fun part of the exercise, like a little bit challenging. But once you make that leap, yeah. then you can start to really think from that point of view, right? And I think you guys did a great job of of being consistent which is another important thing when you're designing backstory and personality and thinking about dialogue. So you had bikini and you had the popsicles and um, your dialogue fit with her sunny personality. So that, that, that was really good, excellent job. Who's next? Yes. Um, so our system really sends to the game and it's specifically in seniors. Okay. So the A would be the companion to this individual. Okay. Um, so that was, that was a specific job. The name, um, I kind of decided that the user would actually name the AI. Yeah, that's very cool. They um, have some sort of connection. If you would have the same name for every user, it kind of disconnects the mm -hmm. um, personalization or connection that you have um, on an individual level with the AI. So yeah. That, um, at that. Um, childhood memory, um, we also want to personalize this. So given the age of the user, um, I think you, you would think that the youth would be an era that they look forward to memory. Um, right. So the child time memory would be something like music from their era. Cool. So you say an 80 year old, um, you know, the Beatles, you know, coming, coming up with something like the Beatles as a child of memory would be appropriate for that person. Um, favorite thing in the world, we kind of, it was, it's been cheap, but um, we said that uh, hanging with that individual or being with that individual yeah. uh, would be their favorite thing. And the biggest fear is being alone. Uh, oh. we're very focused on having this AIB of a companion. Um, yep. That's good consistency. For dialogue, um, you can have very typical things like, you know, how's your day? Um, or, you know, do you want to talk to your kids today? Mm -hmm. um, ingraining certain habits, you know, someone came up with, um, the, you know, making sure that your medicine is being taken. So it also reminds you, um, have you, or suggests that you take meditation if you haven't already, or you know, do some exercise or you know, keep in touch with uh, some of your family members. That's great, that's great. So for your childhood memory, I really like the idea of, of tying it into their experience. Can you guys go one step for, I'm gonna put you in the hot seat for a second. Can you go one step further and tell us about the specific memory having to do with the Beatles? Um, I think it was very, very generic. Just open your mind and, and let it happen. Uh, we discussed like seeing not only like hearing the Beatles for the first time, but seeing them perform Ooh, on TV. Ooh, I like it. Because it kind of, kind of like brings it together like music and technology yep. Yep. from their childhood. Yep, and that's a, that's a really specific memory that people could, it's a very like uh, sensory memory. Right. Yeah, awesome. Good job, guys.